ladies and gentlemen, one of my favorite people on planet Earth to talk to. I'm not sure if he's from planet Earth, but he's here right now, the director of the East Kentucky Science Center and Planetarium, Mr. Steve Russo. Hello there. How's it going, buddy? Good to be back. I, yeah, I always feel kind of honored and privileged to be on here because you always have these cool people like, you know, Eddie Jenkins and uh, and David Prince, and then here's science geek stuck in the middle. <laughs> so, so I'm not sure where I fit in, but I always love, love being on here, well, so I appreciate it. Well, I'm a lot more of a science geek than I am a musician, so, <laughs> so we'll have a good time. But right. uh, Eddie, man, he has nothing but high praise about you. Every time that me and him get together on this podcast, somewhere, somehow, we always end up talking about you. You know, you know the, the third or fourth time I met Eddie, um, uh, uh, he, he gave me this... It was about the time we were doing the moon rocks. Remember the moon yeah. rocks? And he comes up to me. I think we're in the brick house. He comes up to me and says, he says, I found something that, that belonged to my dad years ago, and I was cleaning out his stuff. And it was this keychain that was that was uh, put out as a, an Apollo 11 commemorative. The old keychain has got a little medallion, a little clip thing on the end of it. And uh, it was it was given away by by some company to its employees, some company, I think, in New Hampshire or something like that. Hmm. And it was still in its original wrapper. Whoa. So, so for the longest time during that whole Apollo 11 moon rock thing, I had this displayed at the Science Center. Now, now it's, it's in my house. But I, it was just cool. He found this, and he says, i, I got to give this to you, he says, because you're the only one that would appreciate this thing. So every time Eddie and I are together, you know, we always talk a little space and yeah. geeky stuff. And he's a great guy. You know? Yeah, hey, he, he is a good guy. And he's also out there helping people right now uh, yeah. restoring power and stuff oh, like that. I, so. th- that's right. You know, Eddie's, what, a lineman, I think, or something like that. Yeah, something so like my that. hat's off to all those people. That's, that's a tough thing. Yeah, it is. It's a tough time right now for a lot of people, but yeah. with uh, guys like Eddie and the rest of the guys and gals out there helping restore and power, they're in good hands. And they uh, are. It's just thank God for people like exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We were talking about like kind of a NASA memorabilia and uh, merchandise and stuff like that. My yeah. wife got this. I have to show got it off. NASA but shirt here. on there. Yeah. 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 We were like talking about how you see it everywhere nowadays. Do you know kind of like why that may be or anything? You, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, I, 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 I know they had a funding issue or something at one point. Well, they always they? do. NASA yeah. always has a funding issue. I mean, their their entire budget is, is less than one tenth of one percent of the entire federal budget. It amounts to almost nothing in the grand scheme of things. Wow. Um, and, and they do all these cool things with it. But yeah, I, I, I see teachers come, when they come to Science Center with NASA stuff on. The, the, the kids, the kids love wearing space and NASA stuff when they come to Science Center. Hey, hey Steve, look what I got on, you know, the stuff <laughs> like that. But And there's stores around here that actually sell like NASA T-shirts yeah. and sweatshirts. And it's, just, it's it's great. I love it. Yeah, I think I got this. at Well, she got this at a Ross or something like that. Walmart has it. I mean, yeah. the list goes on and on. Mugs, T-shirts, I, I, I've seen the, the masks. Uh, I've got a couple of NASA, uh, you know, COVID masks at home. And so. Yeah. It's, it's 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 great stuff. You know, it's free PR for the space program. It's wonderful. And it seems that they're uh, – I think the funding issue will uh, solve itself out within the next few years because there's a lot of stuff going on nowadays, oh. it seems like. Uh, yeah. The the uh, the new rover that they have oh, up there on goodness. Mars, the yes. camera on that thing is incredible. You know, I posted something on Facebook kind of joking around when because they actually came up with a video of the landing from the actual yeah, spacecraft. I've seen that. And the thing is, is crystal clear, and I'm saying we, we, we still can't get a good video of a guy robbing a convenience <laughs> store, but here we are, Mars, umpteen million miles away, and we're getting crystal clear photos of this stuff. Uh, it's it's just amazing to me. Now, I, I sit in front of the computer and watch this. You know, the geek I am, I'm like drooling all over my keyboard. You know, it's like, but, but the public likes that. They, yeah. they might not understand the science behind it or might not even be interested in the science behind it but but the photographs same thing with the Hubble Space Telescope people love the photos and the visuals because i mean they're real but they're they're almost artistic so yeah. even if they don't really care about the science behind it, there's still an attraction of stuff like, you know, the Mars landings and and, and stuff with the Hubble Space Telescope and, and things like that. So the public still loves that. It's great. Yeah, and, and I think that the public's going to get a lot more interested within the next few years because I'm not sure exactly what like what has started the whole space thing, go to Mars yeah. and do all this. Like this sh- They have shuttles now that apparently are going to be going to space that people can pay so much for. And yeah. what's uh, really crazy that I seen yesterday is they're going to have a space hotel. Did you see that? 
I saw in 2027? that. In twenty twenty seven. Yeah, six I, years from I now. I saw that. And, um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> the, the, apparently, they're going apparently, to have. Yes. That they're going to have cinemas, bars. It's going to be it accommodates. I think four hundred people, something like yeah. that. And they're going to start construction and. 2025 supposedly and then have it all done right. by 2027. 2027. Yeah. 2 years. You know when I was when I was a little kid, 5 and 6 years old that that was the whole thing. The future is going to be these space stations that are kind of round like wheels and you kind of make them that way because when you rotate them you can then create an artificial gravity field so you can do do things somewhat normal. Uh, but you know, I mean, that was 60 years ago. We were talking about this kind of stuff. So, so who knows? I mean, the, the idea is cool. It's great. I, I'd love to see it. The money is trying to put that. That's yeah. that could be the issue. See, I, I think that that's going to change though with these crazy billionaires they have nowadays, especially you know Elon, Elon Musk is the oh, big one yeah. with SpaceX and the whole. He wants to be the first person to die on Mars, yeah. apparently, or something like that. So whenever you have these people that don't have to rely on the government for funding or anything yeah. like that, you may actually start seeing a lot of advances. And you know, until recently, honestly, I was not a big fan of the the privatization of, of space flight, you know, be, because I remember growing up during the, you know, going to the moon and NASA, and it took literally 600,000 people to uh, to get to the moon and, and an incredible amount of money. Um, and, and to me, the private sector didn't have that kind of money. But but Elon's changed my mind about that. I think, um, you know, I, I think he's doing a good thing. And, and I think he's part of the, uh, the reason that the public is now interested in space again. And, and, and just watching, you know, watching the, the his rockets go, and then they land again the way rockets used to land in science fiction movies back in the 50s and 60s when I was a kid. They, they land upright on these platforms. It's like, wow, this is just really cool stuff. Yeah, it, it really is. And I think that, you know, that will be the future. It that will something be. like my, I don't know if my kids or at least my great grandkids will be able to spend a weekend up in space on Mars if they want to. Yeah, Someplace, yeah. Uh, and but but it's kind of scary too, like the the how they're putting so much work and money and time into the whole Mars thing because yeah. like you know why are they wanting to leave Earth so bad? Yeah. Almost is what you start thinking. Like what's yeah. going on here that they have that they're thinking of this Plan B. So yeah. much here recently. Well, you know, when, when you when you look at it in in reality, most people don't don't think of these things. the The Earth is it's a spaceship. Yeah. And at some point in time, spaceships run out of room for their travelers, and they run out of supplies. I mean, no matter how much you recycle, replant trees, do this, do that, whatever. At some point, you run out of of what you need to survive someplace. In theory, at least, Mars is the only planet that we possibly could, could live on. It's, it's different than Earth, but it it's more closely resembles Earth than any other planet as far as uh, temperature, uh, atmosphere, uh, things of that nature. You, you'd have to change things around a little bit, something called terraforming, and that may or may not be possible. But, you know, and, you know, we're not talking any time now. This might be 400 years from now, but at yeah. some point the Earth will run out of all of its resources, or no, no matter how much you, you try to conserve them. It's a spaceship. You run out. Now, that's the way it is. Uh, so Mars is the only logical choice in our solar system as of this point in time. Now, there's a lot of problems. Uh, you know, your atmospheric pressure is different. Your gravity is different. Your temperatures are different. You know, on Mars, you have a limited area where you could live. So let's say we're talking uh, temperature wise. So on the equator region on Mars on a nice warm summer day, it does get to be about 75 or degrees or so. But at night in the summer, you're still talking zero degrees on the equator. So you're kind of yeah. limited on your, your geographic area where you could actually live on Mars. In the wintertime, obviously, temperatures are much colder than that. You then have to find a way to create an atmosphere that, that humans can live in, but the gravity on Mars is about half of that. So at some point, it's probably going to float away. That's probably what happened to the water on Mars. There was water there millions of years ago. So there's a lot of things you have to go through to make a planet like that livable. Mm -hmm. And and that alone, if you started today terraforming, you know, changing it around so that you could make Mars into an Earth, if you started today, that still might take 150, 200 years to do. Yeah. So it's it's complicated. Um, it, it is. We believe it's possible. Uh, but I mean, you know, who knows? I mean, when you know, in 1965, landing on the moon was impossible, and four years later, we were there. 
Yeah, it, yeah. It, it really is crazy. I mean, and I think that we will get it. It, it could be even faster than 200 years because this yeah. technology nowadays is just advancing oh. so quickly that it's almost impossible to wrap our minds around what will be here in the next five years, it's, let it's, alone 200. Technology is is exploding. Let, let me tell you, I, I, I just got a new cell phone. My wife and I just got new cell phones a month ago. I'll, I'll be dead before I figure out how to operate half the <laughs> stuff on it. It, it. It's a whole new learning curve, even just from the phone I got three years ago that yeah. technology developed that that much of what things can do. The computer industry, it, it's its hard to keep up with. It really is. Yeah, and these kids nowadays. See, I, I'm kind of jealous because I, I, I was born in 96, so I was still, I, I grew up how kids should. Yeah. Outside playing soldiers, yeah. cops and robbers, cowboys, and right. whatever. Yeah. But my nephew nowadays, he's... I think he's eight. Pretty sure I'm a bad uncle. Anyways, <laughs> uh, he he is so focused in this oh. technology nowadays. I mean, he's building his own fans. He's oh, like know. rebuilding computers and yeah. stuff at the time whenever I was still chewing on Legos. Yeah, that's you know? right. And he's not the only kid that's going to be growing up that way. So whenever you have a, kids that are growing up in this advanced era, then you're really like, now what's the future going to be like? Yeah. Yeah, because because the, these these kids now and and the teenagers now, people even people in their twenties, they, they want things faster and faster and faster. So 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 the technology has to keep up with the wants and needs of of what's there. You know, when I grew up in the late fifties and early sixties, uh, technology, uh, dial phones, party lines. Uh, you know, uh, didn't even have electric typewriters at the start of of, of me yeah. growing up. You know. Um, you know, so so the technology w- was a slower pace, R- really, un- until we started with the moon landings and technology started speeding up because we needed that to get there. And then after that, everything just totally took off with the, with the, with the space age, so to speak. Yeah. And now it's just progressing at a rate that each year the technology changes. It's it's crazy. Yeah, so many people want to blame it on aliens or something like that. <laughs> but I, I, I seriously think it's, it's just because of communication. I, I was thinking about that uh, here recently. You know, yet telephones, especially the internet nowadays, oh, my goodness. sharing information, sharing ideas, working on projects, not even have to be in the same room. I think that's why you have so much advanced technology. I, I remember the the internet. I don't even know if it was called the internet then when it first started, and you did. There was no such things. Uh, let me think. I could even narrow this down. 1995, 19, I'm sorry, 1989, 1990, when, when you didn't even have things like websites. Uh, I remember trying to get information from the National Weather Service, and you would take the receiver on your phone, you, you would actually put it on this thing that almost looked like a speaker, and you would type in the phone number. There were no such things as websites. And, and 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 monitors back then were were black and white or or yellow and white. Yeah. There was no visuals, no visuals at all. There was no such thing as visuals with with the internet back then. I mean, it wasn't even called that. Um, and and that was it. You could only get written stuff. You, wow. you couldn't do any of that. And I remember, like I say, 1980, 88, 89. That's what I was doing when I was trying to get weather information. Where you, you, you dial the phone number, put the phone on this crazy looking receiver thing. And there's these words and numbers would come across the screen. No graphics. That was it. And even then, that's only 40 years ago. It, it, wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't that long back. You know? exactly. So it's, uh, it's, it's uh, 89, 90. And then all of a sudden it... Um, it exploded. Yeah. It is a crazy yeah. time to be alive. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. So, so what do you think is going to like, what, what do you see as the future of space? Do you see like Mars as being the future or like the, when it, whenever it comes to what they are trying to accomplish, like how in the sixties it was the moon the landing. Moon. Yeah. What do you think is going to be the next big venture for I, I, space? I think Mars will be the next one if we could solve some of the problems. We also have to have to solve the problems of getting there a lot quicker. You're talking with technology now. It's about a nine, eight, eight to ten month trip to Mars when Mars and Earth are at their closest points. And that still creates a lot of problems uh, medically and biologically with humans being in space that long. Um, yeah. I, I seen like where they would have to like keep exercising so their bone density doesn't go down. Y- you and get bone loss, uh, organ shift inside the body. The blood see, yeah, doesn't I, pump I, as quickly. Yeah, space, I didn't know yeah. that uh, until I talked to you last time yeah. that the organs will actually shift around yeah. inside the body while yeah. you're in space. That is Yeah, I remember you're in, you're in, you know, zero G. Things naturally float around. And that's why when astronauts come back, even from just a couple of months in space, they... 
they've got some stomach issues while things settle in, you know, settle back to normal. Uh, you, you know, the, the bone loss, you're not going to get back again. Uh, you, you come back to earth, of course, and after you've been floating around in weightlessness where, you know, you weigh about as much as this piece of paper, now all of a sudden you're walking around on earth and you, you're, you're trying to walk under your own weight of 200 pounds or so. It's difficult. Everything it changes a lot. So if we could find a way to get to Mars within about a month or so, as opposed to a nine-month trip, it'll solve a lot of problems uh, specifically with the human body and biology and medical issues, because there always there's always medical issues when when astronauts go into space. Once I mean even even the first three or four days they're up in space. Yeah. Uh, the issues of constant nausea, vomiting because because of disorientation, things floating around mm -hmm. in there. So so even if astronauts are only in space for let's say a couple of weeks, first three or four days, it's 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 mm -hmm. terrible for them. Have they worked out the because uh, I, I seen where whenever, whenever they're going to do the whole Mars X mission, that it was going to be a one-way trip. The yeah. people that go on this trip, it is, they're going to Mars, That's you're it. never going to come back. That's is it. it still that way today? It, it pretty much is, because if you think of that time frame, so if, if you're taking nine months to get there and nine months to get back, it's already 18 months, but in order to keep that nine-month time frame, you have to wait for Earth and Mars to get back in their right positions again, otherwise the time to, come, to, to go there or back would be double. So, you know, you're talking nine months there, then you might have to wait a year or so, then another nine months back. So you're talking significant amount of time going there and then coming back again. Uh, humans probably will not last uh, that mm. much time. And they might not even last that long on, on Mars. Um, uh, my, my friend Heidi DeBlock up in Albany, uh, she, she's a, a surgeon up there, but she also was, she's a heart surgeon, but she was the surgeon for NASA for about 15 years that examined the astronauts before they went up into space and then examined them when they came back. And she has documentation. We're not talking opinion. We're talking actual medical documentation of what happens to the heart, the kidneys, the eyes, the brain, the lungs, all this stuff. And... I'd it's say not it's a devastating. Good thing. Yeah. And, you know, I, I wish she lived closer to here. You know, she's up in Albany, New York, because she, she does a lot of talks for schools and astronomy organizations up in New York in that area. And she does this talk called, Do We Have the Heart to Go to Mars? And she puts all this stuff on a PowerPoint screen, documentation of what happens to the body. It's not pretty. Yeah. It, it, it's almost like we, uh, we weren't meant to. Almost whenever it comes to our genetics and stuff like that, but I think that you know that, that that's that, that's the future. Yes, that yes. We progress as a society, and eventually we will move planets. Yeah, uh, you know we will. Uh, you yeah. know, and like I say, you and I are not going to see this in our lifetime. Maybe not even my grandkids, your grandkids, just not going to. Probably not going to see it at that point in time. But you know, uh, again, you know, my my grandfather. Um, you know, even back in the sixties. Oh, there's no way you'll ever get to the moon. We'll never get off the ground. We'll never. No. Okay, Wright brothers. No one thought you could even fly until they did their thing. You know, no one thought of cars years ago. So you never know where that technology is going to go. No. Uh, it, it, even the Wright brothers wasn't that like at the uh, beginning of the 1900s. Yeah. Yes. So I mean, in just a little over a hundred years, we went yes. from almost a paper airplane that the that, Wright right. brothers had to landing, like, to going to Mars, going to Mars, sending a rover to Mars. You know, That's so crazy. You, you just never know, and uh, um, you know, e even me who follows this stuff obviously pretty closely. I, I'm still, when I watch these things, I, I'm still surprised and shocked and, and th that we did these things. Even, even when I watch the old moon stuff from the 60s, just watching the Saturn V rocket take off, how did we ever get something like that off the ground, over a million moving parts on just yeah. that one rocket? How did they work exactly right every time? Yeah, it's, it's amazing to me. What uh, what was the exact name of the exhibit that you had whenever uh, down there at the planetarium with the whole uh, the fiftieth anniversary of the moon? Yeah, landing? we had the moon rocks there, and we had what, the, what was the the the, the, uh, the the laser show? What was it called again? Oh, it was it, when well, we had the fly me to the moon laser show, and yeah, then we yeah, had yeah. Uh, Capcom Go, Capcom, Capcom Go. Go. That, that, that that was it. See, yeah. that blew my mind because I, I didn't know. Well, you you just don't think about it because you think, oh, it's NASA. They might have had computers back then. No, they didn't. The yeah. one picture of that woman standing next to that <laughs> pile of books that was taller than her that yes. she wrote by hand yeah that uh, is it's so crazy to see a picture like that done with slide rules which most people don't even know what they are this was even in a sense in a sense pre-electric calculator days 
You, you know, for, for five or six years, I lived on Long Island and uh, just down the road from Grumman, where they built the Lunar Landers. And I had yeah. a chance to several times have lunch and dinner with some of the guys that were still alive that built the Lunar Landers. And I mean, literally formulas on napkins in restaurants because they thought of something, didn't want to lose it. But the coolest thing was, was that, you know, there, again, no computer CAD programs. You weren't designing things on CAD programs. You could put a little piece here or there. Yeah. They were collecting appliance boxes from places like Sears and <laughs> J.C. Penney. And they were literally, they'd come up with something on paper. They would take razor blades and cut the boxes in the shapes of the panels that they needed insert them together and see how they'd work. And if they didn't work, they'd just throw that out and take out another. So, so the cardboard boxes that you know we played in as kids and made forts and rocket ships, that's how they were designing the lunar landers. And we got to the moon with this stuff. The cojones that had to be on all three of those astronauts that went to the moon. Oh. Man, that was, you're talking about brave. You know, the, the right stuff, the movie, the right stuff, not everybody, yeah, and, and has, has the guts to do that. And, you know, I, I've, I've spent a lot of time with, with astronauts, Story Musgrave in particular, uh, Kentucky astronaut. Um, and, uh, and we always talk about stuff like, you know, were you afraid? What were you thinking? He, he, he says, we're all scared to death. He said, but that's what keeps us on our toes. He said, if any astronaut ever told you they weren't scared, he said, they'd be lying. Yeah. So because if you're not scared, you then lose your ability to, to watch out for situations. He said, we all know that when we got inside that rocket, it would probably be the last time, it might be the last time we'd ever see our families or everything. He says, in reality, for 30 years, NASA tried to kill us all. <laughs> he said, but we understood the risk. We wanted to do it anyway. And really, yeah. that's what makes them the, 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 the right stuff for these people. You know, it's like we're talking yeah. before about uh, you know, um, uh, guys on the line or our first responders. Okay, Not everybody's cut out to, to do this kind of stuff. Not everyone's cut out to be an astronaut. So the, these were special people that, that were sitting on top of hundreds of thousands of gallons of the most explosive and flammable stuff we ever had. Yeah. You know, the, so the launch is dumb, but then something could happen in space. Okay, then you're landing. Something can happen on landing. That There is no one moment of space flight that you could say, in a sense, is guaranteed to be safe. <sighs> It, it, it's, it's crazy, though, to think about that. There's people out there that are smart enough and capable of doing that. And I've uh, looked into the whole back training of becoming an astronaut. Yeah. And, oh. whoa, that's mind-blowing what them guys have to go through. Yeah. And, and it's, it's probably always that one little thing that you don't think of in training that could go wrong, you yeah. know. Um, but it, it's it's part of what it is. It's, it's part of what they do. Uh, you know, you, you, astronaut food ain't bad though. I, now, I, now nowadays it's pretty good. I mean, years ago it was that freeze dried stuff like we sell in the gift shop at the science center. But now <laughs> now it's 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 real food now. I mean, it, it's it's not bad. But uh, you know, uh, you think of all these things. Uh, Apollo thirteen. Okay, that that the movie Apollo thirteen, great movie, Tom Hanks. But in reality, we should have never gotten those astronauts back. But it's only because the guys on the ground have more smarts than anybody. Those guys at NASA and Grumman and, you know, that devised a way to, to get a spaceship back and keep three guys alive that really should have died in space. There, yeah. was, no way, there was no way possible it could have come back because every single thing kept going wrong. But, you know, that's, that's why those guys do that and you and I don't. Exactly. <laughs> you know, that's exactly. the way it works out. I liked uh, whenever – wasn't it Buzz – that punched the guy in the face. That was the conspiracy theorist yeah. about saying that we never went to the moon or something like that. Good Thank old God. Buzz Aldrin. <laughs> Thank God for Buzz. And he hey, he socked him good, too. Buzz was kind of up there in age when he'd done that, too. But, buddy, that right hook was still he, he, good. He, he, was he one, still one had it. few, few moonwalkers uh, around, you know. It's like Yeah, uh, I, I ran into... Uh, one of my old friends the other day, and I, I guess he's changed over the years because he's one of those people that denies that we've... Yeah. He, he just denies space altogether. altogether. He says that space is not real. Okay. And, uh, yeah, I, I just... <laughs> it blows my mind that people it's st like exist. Uh, that's st still like that exist. Especially nowadays with all of the proof. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, well, it's funny because sometimes I see like someone who posts something on Facebook saying that, that that was Photoshopped. There was no such thing as Photoshop in 1969. You couldn't, it would, I don't know if you remember that movie Capricorn 1. I just mm -hmm. watched it the other day. So it's with uh, Hal Holbrook, O.J. Simpson's in it. 
Uh, basically, it was it was kind of that whole thing where we didn't go to the moon and it was filmed in a um, in, oh, a, yeah. in a in a sound stage. Yeah. So Capricorn One came out, uh, I think, about five or six years after the first moon landing, but it was supposed to be the first landing on Mars. And something goes wrong, and they have to take these astronauts and put them in a studio and film the whole thing. And that's all I'm going to say because it's a it's it's a cool movie, so I don't want to you know yeah. spoiler alert thing. Um, but it would cost more to fake. It would have cost more to fake the moon landing than it would have actually gone there, especially in those days. I mean, nowadays yeah. there's CGI, there's computer graphic. This was all pre everything like that. You couldn't fake anything like that. It would cost you too much. And 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 how do you, you know, six hundred thousand people worked on the moon program. How do you keep six hundred thousand people from telling a secret? <laughs> Exactly. And once you start actually talking to people like you and other people that are uh, into astronomy, and you, you can just see that it's, it's, there's a lot of truth to yeah. it. A lot of the people that will deny the whole moon landing or yeah. just space altogether, most of the time are surrounded by stupid people. Yeah. Well, look, look, you know, okay, you've got photographs. Okay, you, you can't fake all those photographs. Um, you know, you, we've got the moon rocks. Now, granted, okay, you, you're not a geologist, so I, so I could have showed you that thing of moon rocks. I got, still got the picture of you holding all the moon rocks, and we could have told you they're from the moon, and uh, who knows, it could have been from my backyard. But the thing is, these rocks were examined by independent scientists all over the world, from GE, from Westinghouse, college professors, this, that. Okay, you can't bribe enough people to say these are moon rocks and we didn't get them in the front yard. Yeah. You know, you, yeah. you can't do that. Well, one of the big arguments is, uh, oh, well, why did we never go back? Why would we have wanted to? You know, we, well, I thought we went to the moon, was it three times? No, it's the Apollo 11, 12, 13 didn't make it, 14, 15, 16, and 17. Okay. And there were three more missions scheduled, but budget cutbacks. Look, okay, that's where I got the, the, three. the In reality, uh, you know, people can say we went to the moon for the technology. We went to the moon for science. Okay, Th there literally was only one reason we went to the moon. And pe people nowadays, you know, that weren't around then don't, don't realize this. We went there for national pride to beat the Soviets. Yep. That was it. Yep, just to beat that Russia. That was literally the only reason. President Kennedy, um, you know, he made that famous speech in May of um, 1961 about going to the moon and all that stuff. He actually intended, uh, well, I mean, he wouldn't have been present, but his idea was if we beat the Soviets to the moon, we cancel NASA and everything. We just drop everything off because the only reason we need to do this was to beat the Soviets. He was not interested in the science. Lyndon Johnson wasn't interested in the science. It was strictly for national pride because you were still in the Cold War days. Yeah. Once we beat the Soviets to the moon... Yeah, we, we, we kept up. We had a few missions after that, but they started to get too pricey. And, and literally, by the time we got to Apollo 12, the, the first mission after the, the first landing, the public lost interest. We, we won the space race. The interest came back a little bit with Apollo 13 because it was almost a disaster. But then once that was over and we got the astronauts back, you know, 14, 15, 16, and 17, they weren't even interrupting you know, I love Lucy on TV or soap operas to show this yeah. on TV anymore. The public lost the interest with it. You know, we, we did the job. We beat the Soviets to the moon. Along the way, we invented 100 years of technology in 10 years. And, and then after that, NASA really just lost track of what they were doing. They took over some, they took some leftover rockets. We built a Skylab space station. And then that was done. And then they kind of lost direction again. We came up with the space shuttles, which, which I still think was a good program. A lot of people don't. And then we stopped the space shuttles. They're all museum pieces. And, and now NASA is in limbo with this SLS system. I mean, mm -hmm. and we got the space station up there with the International Space Station. And now a lot of it's going to, uh, you know, the privatization with Elon Musk and that. So th there's been so many different progressions. But I, I don't think you're ever going to have this major direction uh, this major thing uh, by NASA again, uh, like we did with the moon landing and the funding like that. It, it really now is, is NASA is working with, with people like Elon Musk and stuff yeah. like that. And, and, and like I say, I've turned around. I think that's the way to go now. Yeah, and, and SpaceX has done more than NASA within yeah. the last few years. It's, yeah. it's crazy that some just a regular person who made enough money can create his own company and do more than an actual government-funded space organization right. like NASA. Yeah, and, and you know, that's, that, that's the clincher right there. You said that word, money. Yep. This this stuff is is just not cheap to go by. You know, it, yeah. it well, takes well, a lot the, more than people think. 
The, the government is uh, more focused on uh, stuff that's going on actual here on the ground. They ain't yeah. worried about us space nerds or that's, anything like that's that. That's right. <laughs> but I, I've, I've always been a big uh, Elon fan. And, yeah. and I think that he's kind of helped people... I think he's helped peak the interest back up he whenever has. it comes to space and stuff like that. But I think another thing that has also helped, and I don't know why this is, but for some reason there has been so much talk about aliens and UFOs here lately. Yeah, I, I've backtracked my views on that quite a bit. But for some reason it seems like whenever, you, like last year, for example, uh, in one of those bills that they passed, one of the weird things that they slipped yeah. in there was the whole – I think it was the Pentagon has 180 days to give up information that they have on UFOs. Yeah. And then you had the big cigar shaped object that came into our solar system that supposedly was a spaceship or something yeah. like that. I'm not sure about all of that, but it's like almost every two weeks or so you'll see something in the news about it. And it wasn't that way a few years ago. No, it was it was very much like that in the Late 60s to late 70s, it was a continuous thing. And then it kind of died out. And then all of a sudden, last few years, it's it's picked up again. Uh, and, you know, I, I don't know the reason for that. Are, are there are there really more sightings now than before? I don't know. Is it more of anything now or is it just we have social media so everything's out there? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we, we still can't. You know, still with with all the cameras and everything everybody has, still since the 1950s, we have still never been able to get a clear shot of a UFO, a flying yeah. saucer, a whatever it is still. And, and that still still boggles my mind that with all the video and tape we've had over the years, VHS, uh, whatever, cameras now that, that you can do things, we still can't get a clear picture. I don't know. Yeah, see, like, I've, I've backtracked quite a bit whenever it comes to UFOs because nowadays, like, I have to see the proof. And almost yeah. anything that anybody gives me, I can think of some other reason to where that might be. Like last year, it was the whole uh, Tic Tac UFO from the, oh. the the Navy that had that video. And that the, <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, it was weird that the craft was turning in the directions that it was, but we often forget how smart our government and other governments are. Just because we don't know what this spacecraft is doesn't mean that Russia doesn't know what it is That's or right. China doesn't That's know right. what it is. Yes, we are a very advanced nation with all kinds of mind-blowing technology, but we're naive to think that we're the only ones. And and in our technology, it, it's mind-blowing to us. Maybe if there's another civilization out there, they might be looking at us and view us as Stone Age. Yeah. You know, yeah. technology is, is, is a strange thing. You know, we see the advancement here. Are we more advanced maybe than any other place or are we less advanced than any other place if there is other place with this people? Yeah, that's something we, we, don't, we don't know. Yeah. We just don't know that. Uh, and then that's what makes it all very interesting, you know, yeah. uh, um, what's going on out there. Do we have the technology to, to, to do anything? You know, we, we sent that radio message back in, was it 1973, up to uh, the Hercules Star Cluster from Arecibo, the dish in Puerto Rico that, that collapsed a couple of months back. And it'll take 23,000 years for that message to get there. Okay, so the message gets there. But if there's a civilization there, would they be advanced enough to read the message and send a reply back? Or will they look at it and because they're more advanced than us, will it just sound like static on an AM radio someplace? I, you just don't, there's no answers to any of this. Yeah. One yeah. W- one thing that has always kind of weirded me out, though, uh, I think it was back in the 50s. Did you see like the all the lights that popped up above the White House? Yeah. That was a weird one. That, that's one that people like to bring up to me, and that's I don't have a good answer for that one. The, but, the 50s into the early 60s was a big UFO flying yeah. saucer time. It, it, uh, that, that's where the, the name first got coined, I believe, uh, in 1954, first got coined as flying saucer, um, yeah. you know, things like that. And then, of course, all science fiction movies came out, and it was a pretty interesting thing, you know, mm. Earth but, versus the flying saucer. <laughs> but even back then, we were advanced. Uh, you know, Germany. They, yeah, that's right. A lot uh, people don't like to think about this, but there were a lot of Nazi scientists that joined NASA after World War well, II, and a lot of them when, didn't they help like get us to they, the moon? They they were the ones the 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 German rocket team of when, when we captured that whole uh, setup uh, Puna Monday, which was, which was the German rocket base, I guess you would call it. When we captured all of their scientists, and you know Werner von Braun was the head of that. 
All of their German scientists came over. They're the ones that built NASA. We would have yeah. not gotten to the moon. They were so advanced with their, with their V2 rockets and, and that, that were made for destruction, unfortunately. But it was all of their rocket scientists that got us to go from NACA, the national forgot what NACA stood for, but to change to NASA and, mm -hmm. and get us to the moon. If we didn't have Von Braun and his German rocket team, we would have never gotten there. These guys were so far ahead of us. Yeah. And, and, you know, and, and along with, ca with, with capturing the, all the, the whole German rocket team, we also captured all of their rockets. So you've got guys like Robert Goddard and all, and all of those early NASA guys that set up um, out in uh, New Mexico or Arizona, set up all these launch pads and were launching these V-2 rockets to understand how they work, the fuel systems, the gyroscopics uh, to guide them. Um, we got to the moon because of the, the German rocket team. Yeah, and yeah. a lot of people don't like to think about that, but that's just the facts. And yeah. who is to say that there wasn't somebody out there, a country especially like Germany, that were advanced enough to have these floating lights above the White that's House right. just to say, like, hey, look at us, yeah. you know? Who knows? I, it, it, anything's possible at this point. And, you know, back in the late 50s, um, out in what would people call Area 51 now, um, they were designing, um, and, and they've, it's not classified stuff anymore. You had the Flying Flapjack, mm -hmm. which uh, which was a, a craft that actually looked almost like a, a pancake type of thing. You had the Avro car, which was first, be, was first being designed in Canada, and the Canadian government gave it up. It literally was a flying saucer. Yeah. And, and you know, it, it never worked out right. They would get the thing 10 feet off the ground. It would go 30, 40 feet, and then the thing would, would fall onto the ground again. Um, but, you know, there was development of, of flying saucers and the, the, the pancake, the flapjack, uh, the Avro car by our government back in the 50s and 60s. That, I mean, back in the 50s and 60s out at that you know, Area 51 place is where they developed all the stealth technology that we first used in the first Gulf War. What was that? 92, 93, I forget. Yeah. That was developed out there. Back in the 50s and 60s, it took that long to get these things to where they were perfected. So, mm -hmm. yeah, who knows if some of the stuff we've seen wasn't wasn't government stuff? But, exactly, you know, it's just, just the way it is. A lot, a lot of private uh, gov government stuff goes on like that. Yeah, the, well, they just released a uh, well, they released the information about a drone that the government has now that can go like 1,500 miles per hour, something crazy like that. But it, it looked familiar to me because uh, there was some type of UFO that they seen a few years ago yeah. that almost looked identical That's right. to this thing. Yeah, and I was like, okay, well, that could have been. A, I have a fam. I come from a really big military family, mm. and everyone has told – well, the ones that have worked in intelligence or weapon development, they'll say that they will develop stuff that is not for public use That's or right. public knowledge for decades. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, you can see this – what you think is a flying saucer, but that could just be an advanced – Technology that's not going to be released for another forty years. The yeah. Blackbird was the same the, way. The, oh, exactly. Yeah, it's a great example. And, and you know, your your technology advancement is done basically by two factions in this country. Always has been military and NASA aerospace. Th those are the two things that drive all the technology we have. Whether it's the technology of stuff like landing on Mars, or the technology that's that's in the computers we're using here, the microphones, our cell phones. It's all driven by military and aerospace. It's always been that way in this country because that's where most of the money is. That's where most of your, your, your scientists are that really have the knowledge to do this stuff. So it's always been that way. Yeah, yeah, I used to be a huge conspiracy theorist whenever it came to space and all of that craziness. But uh, now I've gotten older and wiser and not <laughs> as, not as dumb. Then uh, I, I've I've just thought a little bit more. But is there any conspiracy theories whenever it comes to space that you like to believe in or you like to think about every once in a while? You know, I, I think about all the different things. But you know, as as a as a scientist. I have to see proof in anything, no yeah. matter what it is. I mean, you know, and, and drives my wife crazy because sometimes just to buy a toaster, it's like, well, I, I want to see the proof that this works. It's just toaster, <laughs> I'm the same way, buddy. You know, but it's like, I, I, I got to get out of that frame of mind. I was buying a toaster, of them. <laughs> you know. Uh, but, but that's just, I, and I've always been that way since I started being a space geek at like the age of 10 or so. Was I, I have to see proof. It doesn't matter what it is. Yeah. I got to see the proof of it. Um, it's just 
this the science nerd in me that's all it is you know yeah and, and whenever you get that mindset and i have the same one it all it's not that it takes all the fun out of it but you take all the fun out of it for anybody else who wants to talk to you about it because i'm sure especially in your line of work that's a lot of questions that people have are <laughs> are aliens real yada 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 yeah well you know and, and sometimes like my wife and i'll go to a, a a movie or watch a movie on tv that has to do with space or something like that and the first thing she'll say to me or my friends will say to me now look, just shut up and watch the movie and don't tell us that can't happen, that can't happen. I said, okay, it's fine, don't worry about it. Because I find myself doing that. It, it's, it's a bad thing to do, uh, you know, when, when, you, when you're a, a science person, you, you, you critique everything, you know, that, no matter what science fiction movie it is, but it's science fiction, let it go, you know. It's, yeah. it's, people always tease me about that. Apparently that, that Martian movie with uh, Matt Damon was that way for a lot of people. I never got to see it, but I heard... Movie. Was it was it good? Yeah. I, I haven't. Uh, I didn't. I didn't get a chance to see it, but I heard that they got a few things wrong it was, in it that was, movie. You know, and 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 the thing is, and I've got to learn this myself too. Again, being a science science fiction is supposed to be a little science, but most of it really is fiction. My goodness, I could tear apart every Star Trek, you know, with Captain Kirk. But you, you've got to watch it with that frame of mind. It's fantasy. It, it's it's fiction. I can't sit there and say, well, no, it couldn't go from there to there in that time frame. It couldn't do that. It, it, because then, then you don't enjoy it. So yeah. I've gotten a lot better at that where I could actually watch a movie and, and not worry about how correct it is because it's not supposed to be. It's science fiction. But yeah. if, if they do make space travel available to just regular citizens for a decent price yeah. in your lifetime, will you be one of those to take that ride? I'm afraid of heights. I don't even get in a plane. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that, I, I probably... I, I'd give it some thought just yeah. to be, in a sense closer to the things I've taught about my whole life. And, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, my whole life, and all planetary and people are like this, we, we teach about stuff we, we've never had physical contact with. We teach about zero gravity. We've never been in it. Uh, you know, we teach about planets. We've never been there. So even just to be up in weightlessness, even for 30 or 40 seconds, to really understand it, mm -hmm. instead of me teaching what I've heard from astronauts that have actually been, I, I think would be a cool thing. Whether or not I'd be brave enough to do it, I, I, I don't know. And rich enough, too. There, uh, yeah, <laughs> that we know ain't going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, uh, I, I seen a story, I think it was last year, maybe the year before, they were talking about this space shuttle that would bring people basically right to the edge. Yeah. You, you could have the zero gravity a little bit, but yeah. you would still be good within our ozone layer, whatever yeah. smart people call it. But uh, I think even then it was like $100,000 a ticket or something yeah. like that. Yeah, that's not happening yeah. for me. So. But yeah, there's famous celebrities out there. that. Yeah, but, that. but within the next hundred years, possibly, especially if it's just like a little trip around the world yeah, like that, that'd be neat. I, I could see that for $5,000 yeah. or something like I'd that. I'd be way too old for that ship. at that point. It's like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'll, you'll be going back to uh, wherever, which, whichever planet it is that you came from or yeah, something. Yeah, exactly. It's, uh, yeah. So, so I know that you have the uh, Hubble Vision and the Queen uh, laser show down there at the uh, planetarium oh. right now. The Hubble Vision sounds really cool, and I've always been a big Queen fan. Tell us what's going on with that. You know, this has been a long time coming. You know, we the, the Hubble Vision show we, we actually got last year. We were going to start showing it last April because that was actually the 30th anniversary of the yeah. launch of the Hubble Space Telescope. And and the Science Center was actually selected by NASA to, to host a birthday anniversary celebration and of course here comes march 16th and COVID hits and everything shuts down so we yeah. already bought the show we got a special nasa hubble um poster that we displayed there and we were we were closed down so yeah so we got the show we 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 even got laser queen at that point but we couldn't show anything we we opened up after the COVID thing back on september 1st and then on November, there was a, a, a malfunction with a piece of equipment at the Science Center, and the Science Center got flooded out. Mm. And, uh, and we had to close again. And there was some significant damage to, in all parts of the Science Center, except the planetarium. Planetarium was good. That's good. But the classroom, the exhibit hall, uh, there's a lot of work that has to be done. Floors and walls have to be replaced and all sorts of things like that. So I was able to, to, to ask the college, and they allowed us to, to, to let's, let's at least open again for a couple of months. So we, we actually reopened again last Saturday. And we're a year behind, but we're going to show Hubble Vision. It's a great show. Uh, all about the Hubble Space Telescope, the things it discovered. We actually ran it in my planetarium up in Schenectady, New York, a couple of years ago. This is a slightly uh, updated version. 
And so that's about 30 minutes long. Then we're going to do about 10 or 15 minutes of the live night sky. Then 15 minutes of our laser show queen, which is a brand new laser show. So, so basically the, the show we're doing is about an hour long. Uh, we're doing them a, a Thursday, Friday, and Saturdays at 1.30 and 3.00. And uh, hmm. the, the hour long is, is Hubble Vision, Live Sky, and 15 Minutes of Queen. So, so with the Hubble, uh, what all do you get to see with that? Is it just everything with the planets, stars, galaxies, A lot stars, of its discoveries, galaxies, how it was built, the things it does, uh, the future of Hubble. Uh, you know, this, this thing was launched in 1990 and was only supposed to have a 12-year lifespan. It's still going. Wow. It's still going up there, uh, you, you know, and... Uh, and the last servicing mission that they did in 2009 was only supposed to, yeah, 2009 was only supposed to keep it going through 2015. It's still going up there. And maybe for a reason, who knows? You know, so, so it's, it's, it's a great thing. Hubble's always been a, a pet thing of mine. I love the Hubble Space Telescope. My, a friend of mine did the first servicing mission on it year, years ago. And I've just always been, it, other than the moon landing, Hubble's been been my thing. So mm-hmm. to be able to have this show. And, and again, I don't know how long we're going to be open because at some point they're going to start repairs at the Science Center. So we'll, we'll be open the rest of March. We might be open the rest of April, only half of April. I, we, we really don't even yeah. know. We're not even sure. With, with the whole uh, COVID restrictions and guidelines and everything, is uh, what, what all is going on with that whenever it comes to regulations for the uh, science you know we're, uh, we're, we're, we don't take advanced <laughs> reservations uh, and that's why we're running two shows a day uh, basically in our 85 seat theater we can't fit any more than 15 to 20 people in there depending how many people are in each party because we still have to leave six feet in between each person yeah uh, people have to have masks in the science center and the planetarium uh, we've left space enough time frame in between the shows. We literally disinfect all the seats in the planetarium after the show uh, so that they're ready for the next wow. group. So, you know, we, we've got the, we've got the six foot distancing. We've got the plexi up at the gift shop. So, you know, all this is, is with all the COVID guidelines in place. And, and um, uh, you know, but that's also why we're doing two shows a day because we can only fit 15, 20 people in the dome at a time instead of the normal 80 or so. Are you still able to do the uh, birthday parties and stuff well, like we, that? We, right we now? can't do any of that because it would be too many people in a room. And I plus the it. fact that our classroom, where we always have the birthday parties, we receive some damage from the flooding, mm. as did our exhibit hall. So yeah. we really don't even have anything in the exhibit hall. So this really is just a planetarium that's open. And people can walk through the exhibit hall. There's some stuff on the walls, but we had to take out the exhibits because the floor got damaged and other things like that. So it, it's strictly planetarium and uh, right now, and gift shops open, so come spend some money. Um, Is the dinosaur poop there? Yeah, but that's in the display case in the ah, classroom. Dang. We had to take everything out of the exhibit yeah. hall because of the floor in there. So, so some of the stuff is the hurricane simulator still in the exhibit hall. Okay, that's, that's good. Cool. The space shuttle tire has been moved into the planetarium. What um, about the uh, asteroid that you can... Uh, un- unfortunately, the meteor is is in the classroom, uh, so, so yeah, that's kind of off it. limits now. So people can't see the animals right now. So it's put a little burden on us, but but I'm I'm glad the college let us open in, at least to get the planetarium running again. And exactly. So, so that's kind of nice. And, yeah, yeah. For the people that have never experienced a uh, a laser show at the planetarium, it's, it's such a neat experience. Oh, it, it's, it it's, it's it's one of a kind, and uh, it, it's weird walking out of there afterwards. That yeah. is because it's almost like you were. You feel like an astronaut that's landed back on Earth, and you're like <laughs> walking back out into yes. the public. It's yeah. a it's it's a really neat feeling. It's it's an experience. It's the best way, uh, you know. And you know, when I was a little kid at six years old, and my parents took me to my first planetarium show, I was like, "Whoa, how, how do they do this stuff? This is cool." And and I remember walking out of there. My mom said, "You know, what do you think of that?" I said, "This is what I got to do when I grow up." Six years old, I was wow. hooked on my first planetarium show. You know, and, uh, yeah, you know, so it was a, it's, it's just been a cool thing to spend my whole career in there and, and doing stuff. And, and, and actually this Saturday technically is my, my last day. It's bittersweet. And uh, for the people that uh, don't know out there, I know that we haven't said anything about it. This is uh, probably going to be the last time that we get to talk here on the podcast, at least. I'm sure that I'll be down there a little bit. Yeah. And uh, we, who, know, who knows? We may make, make something happen. But, buddy, how long have you been doing this for? So officially, I've been teaching astronomy and planetariums for about half a century, 48 years. Wow. But in reality, I, I, was, I used to take out my telescope when I was 10 years old and set it up on the corners in Brooklyn, and people would stop, and I'd talk about the sky. So, I mean, basically, I've been doing astronomy, let's see, I'm 65 years old. I've been doing it for 60 years. Wow. 
Um, that, that's, you know. that's, that's crazy, and you deserve it. You really do. Well, you, you know, it's it's bittersweet. Uh, you I'd know, say so. I, I mean, you, you've seen me at the Science Center. I, I, I love doing what I do. But at some point, um, uh, you know, you wake up and say, you know, I... I almost can't come up with new ideas to keep things going. And, and I'm the kind of person that when I got to work, I got to give a hundred percent. Yeah. And I got to a point where uh, maybe I'm giving 90 or 85 and, and I don't like doing that because mm -hmm. it, it lets my staff down. It lets the public down. The science center always needs to run at a hundred percent. And, and, you know, being that we've been closed a year with the COVID thing and I was spending a little bit more time at home with, with, with Jan, you know, my wife, and it's like, you know, my family, my, my wife, my kids, my parents have, have always given up everything for me to do my thing. Yeah. And I've put my job ahead of my family, my kid growing up, my wife. and But they all understood that, and they were great with that. They loved it. Yeah. They, they were fine. But now at this stage of my life, it's, it's time to spend a little more time with, with Jan. It's, it's time to make a few more trips a year up to New York where my mom and dad still are, yeah. my, my grandkids and stuff. So. With, with everything being a little bit slow, too, with the COVID year, I thought it was a good time for the changing of the guard. Somebody new come in. They're not going to come into a massive bunch of stuff going on like Eclipse's exhibits. They'll be able to come in and adjust accordingly. And and I still plan on being a volunteer, still doing one okay. Saturday a month and stuff like that and help to train the new person. So I'm not giving it up 100%, but it's when you wake up in the morning, it's now I can do what I want instead of what yeah. my supervisor wants me to do or what the college wants me to do. If I want to go in and volunteer, I will. If I want to sit on my front deck, I will. Well, yeah. that was one of my first thoughts whenever I heard that you were retiring is who's going to be taking it over? Because, I mean, well, you're that's some tough shoes to fill. Well, you know, um, it's the, the COVID thing has pretty much decimated the planetarium field. Over mm -hmm. 400 people lost their jobs in the planetarium field. Most planetariums in the country have closed, might never reopen again. So that was also a good time because there was a lot of people out in the planetarium field that are younger than me that still want to work in the business. So, mm -hmm. you know, we, we've gone through the interview and the hiring process and, and uh, we, we picked three candidates that will now be interviewed by, by the president of the college. One of them I actually know has been doing this for 30 years. Um, so, you know, I, I appreciate the fact that people have been saying well, the shoes are going to be hard to fill. But, you know, most planetarium people are like me. It, it, we're, it, it's our own culture. It's our own language. they got the same warped sense of humor. They're very passionate about yeah. what they do. They'll come in, Whoever comes in will come in and do things a little differently. But it's, it's the Science Center is still going to carry on in a positive note. You know, yeah. and, and so so it's not like anything major is going to happen that, that I'm leaving. You're going to get somebody in there that has the same frame of mind that I do, that understands the community and what they want with science. So it'll, it'll be a good thing. It will be. I, I think so. And, and it's, it's, just, it's just going to be different not seeing you down there. But it'll be good. I, I'm thankful that you're still going to be doing the Saturdays every, every once in a while yeah. and stuff like that, too. But uh, so what's your plans now for retirement? Are you still going to do a lot of the astronomy stuff? Or are you just going to try to maybe pick out some new hobbies? What are you going to do for the rest of your life? Well, you know, it's funny because every now and then I go on Facebook at night and I do some live night sky stuff and people keep saying, please don't give that up. And I won't. Astronomy yeah, that people never cool. give up what they're doing. I don't know of any planetarium person that's ever retired and didn't continue doing astronomy at something or another. So I'll still do some astronomy stuff and, and you know, um, you know, I'm on the board of directors over at the Mac, and my wife and I volunteer. That we'll still be doing that. We're on the Jenny Wiley Festival Committee. We'll still be doing that. Um, you know, I'll help out at the Science Center any 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 way I can. So I'm not going to be bored. No. But if there's a day I just want to wake up and sit on the front deck and just watch the sunset over the mountain across from my house, I can do that. If and there's a day I just want to go into Science Center and do that, I'll do that. And you deserve it. You, you truly deserve it. You know, it. so it is it is bittersweet because I've, I've done this my entire life. It's all I've ever done. Um, and it's been just cool, you know, hobnobbing with astronauts till 3 a.m. in bars and getting yeah. behind the scenes at NASA at places only scientists can go. It's been a cool thing, and I'll, I'll miss that. But, yeah. um, you know, at some point, you just got to spend more time with your family, and you got to turn the reins over to somebody new who's going to come in with new ideas, better ideas, and bring the science center to the next level. Well, and that's fine. I, yeah, I think that that's one thing that a lot of people noticed last year was the we, we noticed what we were take what we were taking for granted yeah. in life. Yeah, yeah, because last year um, I was I was I was quite busy. I was doing this and I was doing a lot of other side gigs. And whenever all that had to shut down, oh. I got to spend a lot more time with my family. I got to spend a lot more time with my friends. And you just 
I realized that that was so much more important than out here trying to make that extra dollar. The money will always be around. The family and friends, they won't be. Yeah, I, I think I think everybody's mindset changed too. You know, I, I you know I, I was always afraid to retire because like oh my god I got to spend every single day with my wife <laughs> and she's and she's like oh my god I don't know if I want you home every day but you know I, I do some work get some stuff done around the house you know I chatted with people a little bit more um, you know so just gave gave me a chance yeah. that whole COVID thing to sit back and say okay is and I actually thought a little bit about retirement a few years ago but you know we had Hubble come in then we had the eclipse then we had Hubble then we had the moon rocks and you can't retire when things are running 100%. You just yeah. can't. You can't do that. So being that it's a slow year, you know, and then I thought about it and said, my God, I've been doing this for half a century. It's it's just time to turn it yeah. over to somebody else that, that, that'll come in with fresher ideas, bring the science center to the next level. And and that's, and that's something I, that, that I want to stress to people that's important. Yeah, okay, I'm not going to be there. That's okay. People need to support the science center and the new director, no matter who it is, and I don't even know who it's going to be yet, but no matter who that new person is, the community needs to give them the same support they gave me. The three people to. that you were uh, talking about, yeah. are they uh, local people, state people? Or are they kind well, of uh, One is from the state here, and two are actually from my old neck of the woods yeah. uh, up well, there. And Well, that's uh, one yeah. crazy thing that a lot yeah. of people may not know about you is that you're not a local guy no. at all, but no. you've been such a blessing to the Prestonsburg community. I mean, and, and the rocketing around Star City, that Facebook page. <laughs> the rocketing around Star City. Every single day, you're posting five different posts in there about stuff that's going on. It, You've been such a, a a great member to the community down there that a lot of people may not even know that you're not from there at all. Well, yeah, I, I was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. I'm a New Yorker, but even growing up, I was always I was always in my jeans, flannel shirts, cowboy hats. Always listening to country music. I was always a country kid growing up in in Brooklyn, New York. And then when I moved upstate New York, I even enjoyed it more because upstate New York is kind of like here. But then yeah. when I moved here, especially with all the music, because this whole area, you know, the, the Highway 23, those are the people I listened to growing up. You yeah. know, I listened to Flat and Scruggs. I, I listened to you know, Loretta Lynn. I listened to Hilo Brown. Most people in New York didn't even know who he was. So coming down here, I kind of found a niche with, with the community that supported the Science Center, getting involved with the MAC and all sorts of other things here. Um, and that's the first thing people keep asking, you retired, you're going back to New York. Like, no way. I don't blame you. My wife and I are Eastern Kentuckians now. The, the, this yeah. is where we're staying. We still want to help out the community and, and, and do things voluntarily. So this is our home. This is it. We're, we're not going anywhere. Yeah. I, I, I'd say this is going to be a tough question to answer. And you can use a few examples too, but like what have been some of the highlights of your career that you look back on now? Some of those memories that you're like, Wow. I can't believe this happened. You know, each place I've worked in has had its own kind of highlights because they've all been different. Um, hanging out with astronauts and uh, literally spending days with them in informal settings, restaurants, bars, learning what they did in space. Some stuff I could never even tell the public <laughs> what things that they did. But getting the firsthand thing that made me a better educator where I could actually teach what went on there. So meeting astronauts. Uh, when I worked in the Schenectady Museum before I moved here, that may have been the coolest museum I ever worked in because Schenectady is a place where basically all the technology in the United States was developed between General Electric, the American Locomotive Company, you know, fluorescent light bulbs, laser technology. That museum down in the archives in the basement had the first x-ray machine ever made, the first television ever made. That's where TV was first invented. Schenectady was first broadcast there. Wow. The first cloud seeding chamber ever built by Kurt Vonnegut and his dad when they worked for GE. The first light bulbs that Thomas Edison made with bamboo filaments. I used to sit in the archives and have lunch and look and sit and touch this stuff. Wow. That was cool. Experience no one else will ever have. Um, in recent years, like, like even here at the Science Center, you know, bringing the moon rocks in, bringing the Hubble exhibit in twice, the, 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 the eclipse, the solar eclipse, five, over 5,000 people attended our observing session. It was one of the biggest eclipse parties in the United States when we had that solar eclipse one in 2017. Mm -hmm. That was cool. And it was cool, not because I had the biggest party around, but because it gave my staff and, and I a chance to give an experience to over 5,000 people in one shot. Yeah. And that, that's what the Science Center is for. It's, it's not for 
myself and my staff. It's for the community, and it's to bring the community things that they would normally not have a chance to see, like Hubble, or last year we did the, the weather event with the National Weather Service. So each place I've been has, has had different highlights because they've been mm-hmm. different communities. Um, I think probably the 10 years I've been here, I've had some of the, the biggest highlights of my career, like with Hubble and, and, and the yeah. moon rocks and things like that. So, um, you know, if I had to do it all over again, I, I would take the same path. I, you know, yeah. I, I've worked for some great people. I've had some awesome staffs to work with over the years. I've worked with astronauts. I've worked with physicists. I've worked with people that invented NASA's communication network in the 50s. So it's, it's been the coolest career, but all planetarium people mm-hmm. have done that. We're, we're, we're our own little culture, literally, of being able to do things that nobody else in the public gets to do. And, and that's the stuff I'll really miss, you know, and, and communicating with the kids in there and the teachers and stuff. Um, but, you know, I'm not going anywhere. You know, if someone still wants to buy a telescope, you could ask me. I'm, I'm not going to yeah. say no, I'm not the director anymore. But, but again, support the new people working there. That's the most important thing you could do for me, support the new staff. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm excited to see uh, where they take it, too, because, yeah. uh, you know, any change is good. And, and I yeah. think that it's very exciting it is. as well. So, you know, who knows? And like I said, I'm still thankful that you're going to be down there. It's still a bittersweet moment. But I'm thankful yeah. that for everything that you've done for the community, it's been it's, it's been awesome having and, you around. And, you know, I, I thank people like you, uh, you know, the, the newspapers, because, you know, as a director, I always get the credit for everything there, but it's not me. It's me. It's my staff. It's people like you that have us on the air to publicize it. It's the maintenance staff at the, at the college that helps us get the exhibit set up. It's the people at the MAC. We would have never gotten Hubble set up if it wasn't for Robert and all, and then volunteered to come over and help us. So, so you know, the, the director of every place always gets all the credit, mm-hmm. but it's actually all the people that work together. Yeah, that, that, that make this and the community itself, the support of the mayor, the, the support of you know, Tony and Pikeville and Samantha here in Prestonsburg, you know, so it's 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 not a one person thing. So when the new person comes in, they're going to have the same support team. And, mm-hmm. and, and that's what's important, that this community supports everything. I mean, not only this, the Mac, whatever, tourism, you know, it doesn't matter. That's how small communities survive. So, yeah. you know, I, I, I appreciate all, all the all you, know, you always have me on here and yeah. it's been a lot of fun. And, and who knows? Maybe I'll be on for something else. Who the heck knows? Yeah. I don't know. I, I just feel sorry for Jan and all this. <laughs> Goodness gracious, girl. Just, if, if she needs to come up here just to escape. I know you, people keep saying, how are you going to survive with Steve being home all the time? So how am I going to survive being home? <laughs> I don't. I don't know. It, it'll it'll be different and fun, but uh, you know, time to do some more traveling around the state and visit some other planetariums I've wanted to see. So uh, it's it's just going to be different. But please support the place. So whenever you got to talk to these uh, astronauts that you have, was there one question that you were scared to ask but you did, or anything like that? No, I. I my, the one question I, that I always wanted to ask them was again, uh, you know. Are they afraid? And, yeah. and, and all of them said, yeah, well, of course we are, you know. Uh, but, you know, most of the time when, when I was with these astronauts, I mean, we did talk some space, but we were talking normal stuff. I mean, I mean, the first time I met Story Musgrave, we were in a bar in Pittsburgh watching a hockey playoff game, I think, between Pittsburgh and Buffalo. And, you know, me, Story, and my wife, Jan, all these other planetarium people sitting at the bar. Mm-hmm. Just, and we're just talking normal stuff, you know, we're just be, because— they don't put themselves up on a pedestal. Yeah, it's the public. We make them out as superheroes. To them, they're they're they're, they're normal people. It's what they do for a living. And every yeah. astronaut I've ever met, you know, Scott Carpenter, Story Musgrave, they've all said the same thing. It's, you know, our our job isn't any more important than the guy selling gas at the gas station. This is what we do. Exactly. So you know, you talk a little space with them, but then you branch off into uh, who's going to win the Super Bowl this year, or which team is going to do this, or what do you think about that? It just becomes normal conversation, like you're sitting in, in your living room talking to your friend. That's, That's the way it is. Yeah, you don't like really see any uh, astronauts that put themselves up on a pedestal and act like a famous person. The only reason that you hear of Buzz and all of them from the first one was just because it was the first one. Right. Whenever it comes to other astronauts, what I know the guy with the mustache. Uh, that's about it. What's his name? He has a mustache. I think he played the guitar up in space too. He's the first person oh, to play the uh, guitar. I forget that guy's name. He's like the he he's been like the most recent one to kind of you see him a lot more than you do other astronauts. I'm not sure why. And, that and then on uh, there was the guy, the astronaut from Long Island, uh, Mike uh, Mike Massimino, who made five or six appearances on The Big Bang Theory on yeah, TV. Okay. Yeah. 
I love um, that show. You know, or, or the the big thing on Facebook lately is the picture of um, Bruce McCandless floating up in space with the MMU that that unit that we've seen. And yeah. and I, I spent a whole day with him one time. Uh, had dinner, had lunch, had beers. It, it's, you know, it sounds stupid, but these astronauts are the most down to earth people. Yeah. No pun intended. They're, they're, yeah, they're, they're just <laughs> normal people. It's They go into space. You do radio. I teach about space. It's just it's just the way it is. And it's been cool being with these people that are, are really as normal as you and I are. Do you bring up topics like aliens or anything like that whenever you're talking to these astronauts or Every something? Every now and then. What yeah, do they yeah. say? You know, well, you know, a lot of them have seen things in space that they don't know what they are, you know, unidentified flying out, whether, whether or not it's aliens or not. And, and, and all these people, all planetarian people, astronomers, ask, we, we all believe there's life up there someplace. Yeah. Now, whether it's the alien stuff you're always seeing on TV, probably not, but, but there is life out there someplace. They all believe that. Yeah. You know, so it's, uh, and, and, and them, when, when they've been out there, uh, you know, they, they get this just interesting experience. You're up in space. Base. Uh, a lot of them, even though they're they're not religious, say it's it's almost like a religious experience. You're 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 up in space. You're looking down on the earth. It's different. Yeah. So a lot of them have a, have a change of the way they think about things too, just as cause of, of of what they do. But you know, they're they're just a great group of people, and and that's something I, that you know, planetarian people are very fortunate that, that we we've, we've been on a first name basis with people like astronauts and the technicians that got us to the moon and and stuff like that. It's just a, a really cool thing that most of the public will, will never get to do. And that's that's been some of the highlights of my career. I'd say it's been such a fascinating life. It to is. Live. It, it, it is. It's uh, the people I've met, the places I've been to, the hardware I've been next to, the actual rockets that have launched. I actually sat inside the centrifuge that trained all the Apollo astronauts. It wasn't moving at the time. I was going to ask. But, uh, yeah, I, 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 I wish. <laughs> but uh, yeah, they, they they let us actually sit in the the centrifuge that that, wow. that you know, all, all the Mercury, uh, Gemini, and Apolo astronauts use. And I just okay, I'm sitting in the same thing that Neil Armstrong trained in. Wow, how many people could say that? Wow. It's just cool. It's you know, and I think that whenever it comes to public interest, that science and space will be the next venture with everything going on, and that's really exciting to me because yeah. within the last few years, well, the last few decades, there hasn't the interest hasn't been there. You have a right. little bit, but it hasn't been popular yeah. like it was yeah. back in the '60s and '70s, and nowadays yeah. it's, it's getting back there. And you know like. that's why places like planetariums and science centers are important because the people that work in planetariums and science centers have the ability to bring really tough things of science to understand down to a level where the public can understand. That's why Carl Sagan was probably the greatest astronomy educator there ever was because he could bring the most difficult topics to understand down to the level of kids or adults to understand. And that's why a lot of people actually are afraid of science because they think it's too technical for them to understand. And that's why we need things like planetariums like we have here or, or any community that has a planetarium because the, the personnel could bring that level down to the public to make it interesting and not make the public afraid of it. That's the importance of it all. I, I, I get that. And thank God for people like that, too, because I'm one of those dumb people that's like that. Uh, uh, for people out there, watch The Office. There's you know, <laughs> Explain this to me like I was yeah. five. Yeah, I'm definitely one of those people. Yeah. But it's it's a very exciting place to be. And anybody that's never visited the East Kentucky Science Center and Planetarium, please go check it out. Yeah. Whenever it comes to uh, all the uh, – I know I understand the damage was done and all of that. When do you think that might get itself sorted out? Uh, they, they're thinking as of now they, they might start uh, to be able to work on that maybe towards the end of April. And once they start that, we'll, they'll probably be closed for another several months and then, then reopen again after that. So, so you know, that's why we were lucky to open now. So we got the rest of the month of March, maybe the first few weeks of April. You know, it's hard to tell uh, mm -hmm. when, when this stuff gets started. There's a whole process that mm -hmm. goes by. But as of now, the last thing I heard as of yesterday was may, maybe about the third or fourth week of April, we might have to close again. So, okay. Uh, you know, but it's hard to tell. We, we just yeah. really don't know. What are you going to do on your last day? Do you got anything special planned? Well, you know, I anything? mean, technically speaking, so, so so my last working day will be this coming Saturday, and I'm actually working at the Science Center, so I'll be doing the programs. Then I've got a week of vacation, then I go back in on the 15th just to turn in my keys. So technically speaking, this Saturday is my last working day. So I'm going to spend my last working day talking about the Hubble Space Telescope, running Queen, showing people the night sky. Um, that's the way it's supposed to be. It's going to be awesome. And I'm going to go out with the Hubble show because, you know, I love Hubble to death. So 
uh, it, it works out nice. I, I think that it seems. I, I think that everything happens for a reason, and if you pay attention to what's around you, you can see signs. Yeah, and I and I think that everything that you've told me, it's this is the sign that it is time i can see it is i can see why you're doing it and i wish you nothing but i i, I know you're gonna have good luck no matter what you're <laughs> you're, you're a smart man but I, I i wish you the best retirement thank you for everything that I thank that. thank you and for and everybody else at the east kentucky science center and planetarium for everything that you've done for the Prestonburg community and everything that you're going to continue doing yeah just again thanks buddy. Well, I, I, you're welcome and uh you know it's, I, I love this community my wife and i love it and that's why we're staying here and we'll We'll just keep plugging along and do whatever we can. So for the people that want to check out the Hubble Telescope Program and the Queen Laser Show and just the East Kentucky Science Center and Planetarium in general, where where do they find it at? And uh, where do they find the information for it as well? So let's see. So, so again, we're open Thursday, Fridays, and Saturdays at 1 o'clock. And we have shows at, um, uh, excuse me, uh, 1.30 and 3. Uh, we have a Facebook page at East Kentucky Science Center and Planetarium. Not just East Kentucky Science Center, East Kentucky Science Center and Planetarium, and that's where I post all this, uh, all the stuff about the Science Center uh, and, and things like that. So go on there and uh, take a look. But come out and come on out and see us. And if you don't come out this weekend, uh, my last weekend, I've come out other weekends. Doesn't matter. As long as we're going to be there, whether it's me or someone else, don't matter. I have to ask before I go. I don't know if I've ever asked you this. Why? Did you ever have you ever tried like the crickets or anything in y'all's gift shop or anything no. like that? What? How can you? O- work only it? only the astronaut ice. The, the kids are always. I'll, I'll give you five dollars if you if you try one of these crickets. You couldn't give me five thousand dollars to chew on one of those crickets. They're not bad. The cherry oh, ones that you have goodness. are not bad. No, my, my insanity is drawn at eating freeze dried crickets flavored like cheeseburgers. <laughs> Listen, you live in Brooklyn for God knows how long. Who knows what you ate through the oh, years? Oh, that's true, too, but I didn't know what I ate at that point. But uh, no, I, I, I'll, I, I'll probably go to my grave never having tried one of those crickets, and that's fine. <sighs> well, for all the people out there, they can come try some crickets this weekend. But Steve, thanks again, buddy. Always a pleasure, man. Have a good one. See you next week, folks. Boom. That was fun.